Welcome to Interior Analysis. I'm Evan Westman. I'm Jelani Kelly. And today we're doing Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End. So this is going to be the last of the pirate movies we do. I'm not that inclined to do on Stranger Tides. And I'm going to just say that, like, this is the end of the trilogy. I know there's more of them, but we're going to treat it that way in this. So... You finished watching this, like, a matter of minutes ago. Yeah. So, Spitfire Reactions, what did you think of it? I hated it. You hated it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was long for no reason. I didn't really find it as interesting as the other two. There were so many parts that could have been cut out. It did not need to be anywhere near three hours. It's like... Each movie increasingly got longer and longer, and I was like, they don't need to be that long. In the beginning, they killed the kid, and that's hilariously effed up. I don't know why I made a note of that, but I was like, oh, they killed a child, a singing child. That's that's pretty funny. In how dark that was. It was like trying too hard to be edgy, you think? Yeah. Several parts of it were. I think that's fair. Commodore getting capped. That was... It's like, okay, I felt nothing when that happened. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Will getting stabbed, I was like, oh, he's going to come back. Because they can't kill Will. Yep, um, too much plot armor. Yep. Even though two villains, the two villains from the previous, the second movie died, like the two main villains of, what was the English dude's name? The one with the wig? Oh, uh, Beckett. Yeah, with Beckett and Davy Jones dying, the movie still felt incomplete. Maybe because I didn't completely understand what the hell was happening in the end. Even though they had three hours, it still felt like it wasn't finished. Or at least the trilogy wasn't. I know there are more after. I don't know what those entail. I don't really care what those entail. And then once it got to the war part, I kind of just tuned out. Like with the ship war, I had no idea what the hell was happening, what was supposed to be happening. Like I was so lost and... Tia Dama was a damn storm and crabs at one point and then a giant at another point. Like, yo, what? And then this person had the key and this person didn't have the key and the pirate king and the nine pirate lords and voting and oh, oh my God. And then Jack being in limbo, but he really wasn't dead because they just brought him back without doing anything special and... Oh my god, this movie So was... you hated, like, everything about yeah, this. Yeah, <laughs> this movie was just... I, I didn't like it. I don't know if I'm surprised at that. I was half expecting this to actually be your favorite, although I'm not really sure why. I didn't really feel like anything was paid off. We are definitely going to get into that. You might be able to convince me otherwise through your I, points. No, I'm not going to try to convince you otherwise. So, this was probably, like, my sixth time watching this, and I was really disappointed like i used to love this movie mm. i like the first several times i saw it and you know it, i gradually liked it a little bit less like i don't know i think i saw this when i was like 17 something like that it was the last time and i was like yeah give or take it but like middle school early high school i loved this this is actually my brother's favorite of the trilogy and always has been and after watching this, I was like, like, I, I just, I can't see, I understand what I felt as a kid watching this as like a 12 year old, mm -hmm. because it was like, it's, it's such a ride, at least it was. And I remember it being that way, but like watching it now, I just, I feel none of that. And it's kind of sad. I'm, I'm so sorry to start this on such a downer, but Unfortunately, I think the day has arrived that I'm, like, too old for this movie or something. Mm. We're definitely going to get into the stuff you were talking about with how it doesn't feel satisfying. Because I used to think it did, but now I, I really do bump on the ending. One moment I do want to talk about. The part at the end with the two British soldiers and then your favorite duo together. How bad was that for you? I don't even remember it. I might have put it out of my head. I was okay. kind of I was kind of checked out at that point, so I don't 
I think I know what shot you're talking about. Like, they were all just screaming, weren't they? Yes, and, like, I totally forgot about that moment, and then I marked it when I saw it this past time. I was like, oh, man, Jelani's just gotta be, like, this is... This is, like, everything you hated about it. Yeah. At least I that was what I was thinking when I saw it. Just one other bit of follow-up from something you said in the Curse of the Black Pearl episode. Mm-hmm. I rewatched the blacksmith fight scene. I didn't, like, go out of my way to do it, but mm-hmm. I've been working at this restaurant where they have Curse of the Black Pearl and Jaws on repeat. What the hell? It's, like, a right-off-the-beach restaurant, so... They have a very, like, seafood vibe. So they have... Yeah, they have Jaws playing all the time and then Pirates 1 playing all the time. And, like, a couple days ago, the blacksmith fight scene was on and I didn't... I wasn't busy. So I was like, okay, I'm going to watch this and see, like, whether I see the Jason Bourne thing you were talking about. And Mm -hmm. it's it's definitely there. I don't think it's as chaotic as Jason Bourne, but I see what you saw there. Mm -hmm. Any other initial reactions before we move on no okay so to start with something i'm gonna say good this is a good choice that was made but one of only a few i think they do kind of make a theme of collaboration with this which i i think is the right move because at the end of dead man's chest you've kind of created a rift in pretty much every relationship with the characters like there's kind of a rift between will and elizabeth jack has effectively screwed over everyone at this point even though he's dead now like that sort of atones for it but now you're bringing barbosa back and there's still a lot of bad blood between them and then you bring in right from the start you have sao fang who's like got beef with jack oh yeah i forgot about him yeah well he's also not there in the second half of the movie so (laughs) that's not that surprising but like you right from the start you have a whole bunch of conflict between all of like our protagonists basically i think it's fair to call them protagonists and i'd forgotten about this line or never noticed it but one of the first lines that sao fang says is the only way for a pirate to make a living these days is by betraying other pirates and i feel like that pretty much holds true Actually, it very much holds true in the rest of the movie, both with the main characters and with some of the other pirate lords. Like, it is, I think, a really smart choice. Maybe not really smart, but it's a good idea to make there be so much conflict between all these people and make the whole goal of this movie to have all the pirates come together and collaborate to, like, you have genocidal stakes right from the start. I know you thought it was a little bit over the top the way they did it, but like they are bringing it in terms of scale at, at face value that's happening. So it's, it's a fairly effective choice to have like the only way to survive is to unite. And even in this, like the way things turn out with this, the main difference between the pirate side and then davy jones and beckett is that the pirates unite and davy jones and beckett basically end up splitting like they're at odds with each other the whole time and that ends up being it's not really what causes their downfall but it is a difference between the two so the problem with that is i didn't feel like there was any real resolution and I take it you didn't either. There's that scene where they ha- they're they like all hoisting the colors and all the pirates are united and all that. But it really does not feel earned, nope. I don't think. Which is, it's not a deal breaker. Because again, you know, I watched this five times and never questioned that at all. But if you actually take a look at it, I don't think those like conflicts are ever actually worked out. No, absolutely not. And you, you'd think trimming the fat with some of the ridiculous and flat falling jokes that they had, they'd have time to hash out their, their issues with one another. Cause it's supposed to represent like major countries of the world, right? Yeah. Um, well, you're talking about the nine pirate. Lords. Yeah. 
Yeah, they are kind of like they're trying to pull from like all different groups, yeah, but I think Africa, Asia, yeah. specifically France for some reason. I think Spain was in there. It doesn't even like those characters are really only there for a couple scenes. I think you could have maybe created some kind of conflict between the pirate lords and you know in the one scene with the brethren court like they don't exactly get along but we also it wouldn't take a lot for us to understand any kind of conflict like it would come up just in that scene if there was a rivalry between the two groups or whatever Mm -hmm. but the conflict that is really more important to this is between the characters that we've already met and they build on it and This is going to lead us pretty well into the next topic, which is that this is just way too damn complicated. Oh, yeah. Side note, I'm so sick. They did this in every goddamn movie where it's like, okay, you give me him and I'll trade you this person. Okay, now this person is a part of this crew, but what are their true intentions? We don't know. Every (laughs) major character across all three of these damn movies did that at some point. Is, is that supposed to be compelling? Like... <sighs> uh, I think, yes. Like, uh, literally, I think that the phrase, do we have an accord, is used around, like, five to ten times. And most oh of them are God. probably in this third movie. I was done by the time they got to that one... It, it was a really cool shot. Like, all this water around this one strip of land. That was really cool. Like, oh, oh, the parlay scene. Yeah, but then it was like, okay, now we're going to do what we've been doing all three of these movies. Let's trade. Let's trade humans. Let's trade lives. You know, I'll give you Jack. You give me Will. Will is like over there like, oh, no, I'm a badass. Now I'm part of I'm part of this crew. I chose to be over here. It was it was my right as a pirate and all this. And then as soon as Elizabeth is like, yo, come over here. He's like, oh, oh well, she said you heard what the lady said. Like. Bro, oh my god. It's, yeah, although while we're on that scene, bit of a tangent, but the guitar riff leading into that, so sick. I don't remember most of the music. I only remember the main theme, but... Okay, you gotta go back and listen to it. Parlay Mm -hmm. by Hans Zimmer. It's a freaking amazing track. But, yeah, that... I don't even know where to start with how complicated this movie gets like as i've said this is my fifth or sixth time watching this and i gave up after pretty fast i would say you know what i I think i gave up like as soon as will struck a deal with sao fang i don't even understand what all the deals are it's Mm -hmm. like yeah will is supposed to betray the other pirates to Sao Fang for some reason. And I don't even understand why. And then like, while they're at Davy Jones locker, I think Sao Fang strikes some kind of deal with Beckett to like hand over the pirate Lords. But why would he want to do that? And that might've not actually have been what he did, but the fact that like, we don't know is that's a problem. And then that scene right after they get back from the locker, where you've got like the endeavor the Pearl, and then Sao Fang ship all lined up next to each other. And there's like a conversation going on. It's like Jack and Beckett are on the Endeavor making making some deal. Will, Barboza, Elizabeth, and Sao Fang are on the Pearl, I think. And they're all having some kind of negotiation. Like, I was like, holy cow, what is happening? Yeah. Like, even if there's a cohesion to it, it's way too fast. Like, the energy of that scene is actually pretty good, I thought. Like, it feels like something's happening. You can tell it's, like, building to something. But you don't know what the hell is happening. No idea. No idea. And also, like, I think in that scene, or at some point, I think there's, like, three separate people. I think Sao Fang, Jack, and Will, all three of them, at some point, agreed to deliver the Brethren Court and all the pirates to Beckett. I think that happens. I don't remember any of the deals. I don't know who was... T- Evan. I don't yeah, know, man. it's... We may have already spent too much time on this because, like, there's nothing underneath all this. Like, I don't really understand... Actually, I kind of understand maybe why this happened. One good thing. It is a good thing about having all of these betrayals is it does 
contribute to that theme of collaboration. Again, that ends up falling flat, but if you're going to have people come together at the end, it is good to make divides between them and make agreements that some fall apart and some don't. Like, that is, I think, the way into this. It's just the way they went about it is just not right. And I'm pretty sure the reason for that is that this got rushed into production. Like, this came out one year after Dead Man's Chest, which is fast. And Dead Man's Chest was only three years after Curse of the Black Pearl, which, you know, that's long enough that they would have had time to work on the script. But two in that time is... It's fast. And this was the biggest budget movie ever at the time it came out. And I think it's still in, like, the top five. I think it maybe got passed by, like, Endgame and Justice League. So, you know, of course they had to make it. Wait, when was this out? 2007. Oh. I think it held the record for biggest budget for a long time. Of course, that's also subject to inflation. But in any case, a lot of money was put into this. So they, like... They needed a return on investment. Well, with that war scene at the end, I can see why. Yeah, there's, there's yeah, just of a course. lot like, happening there. I, like I said, I didn't. I checked out. I don't know what the hell was happening there. I was just waiting for the point where it was inevitably, inevitably gonna happen. Like you have the war scene, and then it gets cut down in numbers, and then you just get to the part with all the main characters at the towards the end of the war scene. It's just like, okay, here we go. I'm back. Yeah, well, the thing that I've I've never fully understood, like, even when I was younger watching this, when I still liked it, I've never understood why it's just the Pearl and the Dutchman having it out with just the two of them. In I didn't even realize battle. that. Like, they were the one, they were the only two ships swimming around Calypso, right? Well, the Maelstrom, which I guess, like, I think I you're supposed to assume that that's caused by Calypso. I thought it was Calypso. And when uh, when I, I saw is. that, I was like, no, that's Charybdis from Greek mythology, not Calypso, but okay. Well, I think the Maelstrom was kind of, I almost want to say it was their Kraken for this, like the thing they really wanted to do. And, you know, they were just like, we have an unlimited budget. Let's go nuts. Let's make a whirlpool battle that's like I, I don't believe a single frame of that is has any like live photography in it that's mm-hmm. got to be all computer they, generated. they also said before that scene let's make her giant and then have her turn into crabs and fall into the sea yeah and then like the other thing that's a little bit dumb about that and a yeah let's bit. get into it now like when that happens they immediately give up, and then the wind starts blowing, and they, like, nobody makes the connection. Oh, wait, maybe she's not mad at us. Maybe she is on our side. And even then, it is unclear, like, is the Maelstrom supposed to help them or hurt them? Right, because they say, oh, we have the wind on our side. That's all we need. That's what Gibbs says, right? Yeah. And then they immediately cut to Beckett, receiving word that, yo, Beckett, the wind's on our side. He's like, oh, really? Okay, cool. Let's attack him. Like, whose side is she on? And then she starts making Davy Jones wet by raining on him. I'm going to defend that slightly. Somebody absolutely fact check me on this because I have no idea if this is true. But I think, theoretically, the wind is on both of their sides because I, I think to make a maelstrom, like, scientifically you would have to have the wind coming from, like, two opposite directions or something. Something like that. That might be complete BS, but, like, maybe that it... Obviously, like, this isn't something where they would go and actually research that. At least, I don't think. But then again, they probably spent a lot of time on the Maelstrom, so they probably did at some point think, like, hey, how do these actually work? I don't think it mattered how... You think they were looking in the science when they had a giant lady turn into crabs, Evan? No, but I'm sure they tried to re to like create a maelstrom that felt real. And to their credit, the maelstrom does look pretty good. Like I don't think it was really what this needed. Like I would have taken more kraken over the maelstrom any day. Also, 
when the hell could Davy Jones start phasing through objects? That was nowhere in the last movie. But uh, now he's kind of teleport, phasing through cages and phasing through the steering wheels. I think it may have been slightly established in the second one. Like you'd think he'd use that all the time to just spook the hell out of people or something. Well, he or, does, you know, not get he hit does by a in sword. the second one. There's the part where Jack is looking through the telescope at Davy Jones, and then he's right there on the pearl. Yeah, that was freaky. It's not quite what you're talking about, but like those I are think two different they, abilities. I'm looking at it from they're a superhero at least connected. perspective. Teleportation they're at least... and phasing? No. Okay, I guess not. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Fair enough. They they created that, but you know he's a C. It would have been cool to see him use his abilities more, I guess. Okay, but those effect shots have got to be mad expensive. Like True. him phasing through. Things. I mean, they had. They a, could probably only do it. They did have a big budget. That's they true. Had a, yeah, that and the giant lady turning the crabs. I'm not gonna get over that. Um, <laughs> but he also, for some reason, he was more menacing in the second movie, Davy Jones, because in this one he was kind of just a pawn until he killed mm-hmm. dude. That was freaky as well, where he just choked the dude to death and put his tentacles through the dude's brain his face tentacles yeah that was i knew you were gonna have a reaction to that that was like a fatality without the blood like bro yeah i mean it was cool but like jesus christ is the movie's pg-13 that's i wanted a little more of that kind of davy jones yeah like Like he was way more how little of him there is yeah and this one he was just everybody's pet because everybody had his heart at one point and that was another thing. Too many damn MacGuffins still. And with everybody... I think at this po- at some point in the story, every major character wanted something different. And that did not help the story whatsoever. Mm-hmm. To tie it back to the complications we were talking about, the motivations, I think, are the main cause of that. Because everyone does want something. Which, you know, you do want that for your story. Like, a lot of what makes a character is what they want. And... Everyone kind of has a reason for wanting it, but like you were saying, I think it does switch for people at a few points. And also, like, they all seem on board with, like, different parts of other people's plans at different times. Like, sometimes the Pirate Lords and, like, Jack are okay with releasing Calypso, and sometimes they're, like, absolutely not. Right. And that all got really confused, especially, like, it felt to me... And I'd have to go back and actually confirm this, but it felt like they were just kind of using mostly Will, but also Sao Fang a little bit, just kind of however they wanted. They were just like, something needs to happen. Let's make them want this, especially this. Will says, I need the Pearl to save my father. I don't think that's actually true. Like, nope. how is that going to help him, aside from just having a good ship? And it didn't even... He didn't need it in the end anyway, because he just became the captain of the ship, so... Right, and was he trying to make a deal with Davy Jones? Like, Davy Jones didn't ask for the Pearl. There's been enough and damn deals. There had I... been enough of those. It's too much. And the thing about it, too, is, like, it really is the reverse, I think, of the second movie. Because, like... We kind of said in the second one, the plot is serving the characters maybe a little bit too much in that one. Mm -hmm. Because I think we both said, like, that one feels a little bit inconclusive. Like, this doesn't feel like an ending exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's what you would hope this would deliver. So in this one, it feels like the characters are at the mercy of the plot. Which, you normally don't really want that. You want them to feel the same. But for the end of a trilogy, like... Of course, if you have to choose one, you should choose plot over character. The problem with that, I think, is they went to an ending that, like, why was that the ending they picked? I I don't, I don't get that. Let's get into the ending. So, because I don't know what happened, Uh, I'm gonna explain it how I saw it. Will became captain of the ship of the Dutchman. And he only got one day out of ten years. Wait, let let me finish. One day out of ten years to uh, spend with somebody, <laughs> and that day would or had already 
come or he gets the one day at the beginning and then waits 10 years because he was with Elizabeth on on the beach and there was that really really creepy ass scene with him breathing on her leg and her enjoying that before yeah that's about as much as they could get away with in a Disney movie what was the point in that i i just assume we're gonna get into their relationship in a bit i just assume because of that they were just screwing each other all day but then he still did that and then they cut to her face and i was like wait what's happening and then they went back down and showed he was still near her leg and i was like is any of this necessary and that question was never answered for me but i just assumed no i mean the answer is probably no (laughs) so then he just they just looked at they they kissed each other at the end and that was it like i guess he was going back to to the dutchman to be the will the dutchman yeah and she was going back to whatever i don't know why she doesn't just become part of that crew but it was that and then jack Barbosa left him on the deck again, and I'm guessing Barbosa needs to go back. No, he he was off at sea with the compass. And I don't know where the hell he was going. I guess the Fountain of Youth, because I know yeah. one of the movies is about the Fountain of Youth. It the is, the fourth one. So the fourth one, just to summarize it for you and give a little bit of, I don't know about context to the ending, but to show you where they went a little bit, like the fourth one they do go to the Fountain of Youth, and it's just Jack, Gibbs, and Barboza are the only three characters that carry over. And I won't get into more of that, mostly because I haven't seen it in a while. I have heard that Will and Elizabeth do come back in the fifth one, as well as their son. They have a son. Yeah, so that's actually part of this movie. It's it's in a post credit scene. They show, like, Will going back 10 years later, and then Elizabeth is with their, like, 10-year-old kid. So they did so, do it on the island. Yes, but that's that's maybe in a post credit scene. Maybe so. him breathing on her. I, I did not stay for the credits. As soon as I saw the two writers' names or directors' names, Ted and Terry. Yeah, Ted and Terry. As soon as I saw that, I closed out of it because... <laughs> I didn't even know they started doing post credit scenes even back in 2007. When was it was Iron actually Man? back to 2003. They have one in all three of them. They have, uh, in the first one, it's like the monkey going back to the cave and getting a coin, which is, like, supposed to be part of how, like, it was Tia Dalma brings yeah. Barbosa back. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I guess. That. Um uh, yeah, and then in the second one, they show the dog being king of the uh, cannibal island, and in the third one, it's the one I was talking about where they show, it just shows, like, the Dutchman appearing, and then Elizabeth is, like, walking on the beach with their kid. Maybe him so, breathing on her leg got her pregnant. I don't know, I mean, these are days when the stork apparently still existed, so, like, there, there's always that. <laughs> there was one very funny scene I'd like to point out, well, not very funny, it was just it made me chuckle in the moment, but other than that, I was frowning the entire movie. With Barbosa, when Jack came back on the ship and they were arguing who's going to be captain, then Barbosa whipped out the telescope, and then Jack whipped out a, a small telescope. <laughs> yeah, that that one actually doesn't get old. Like I still laughed at that one, even though I knew it was coming. That was yeah. That and was then he comes funny. back later with like the two new telescopes oh, together. My God. But then Jack and Gibbs and then Jack smack talking those two women that have been hating him for years but still wanted to hang out on his ship. Yeah, I think they just did that to, to like, have a third round of the slapping gag. It wasn't funny. It's never been funny. Fair enough. But, like, in a way, I applaud them for trying. Then Gibbs went back with them and then Jack just sailed off on his own on a dinghy. Yeah, and so so let's let's get into that a little bit because I feel like you're supposed to think that that moment is resonant as in kind of calling back because the first shot we see of him is when he enters on a sinking ship. Yeah, and he's on like almost the exact same kind of boat at the end with like probably the same thing he started with like rum, the compass, 
and his sword, and now he's got the charts too, but that's kind of trivial. But why is that his ending? Yeah. Because they actually kind of, and I never f- really noticed this before, they kind of try to have an arc with him in this, where he's got like a second chance at life now, and he's debating like should i stab the heart and live forever because now he's got an even intenser fear of death than before and there's that line from his dad right that 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 old looking dude that kind of shut down the pirate lord meeting was his dad right Mm -hmm. and he says like it's not about living forever it's about living with yourself forever which good line ties in with it but then at the end why doesn't like i feel like there's an opportunity to have him do something that would like make him be able to live with himself forever Mm -hmm. and i don't know what that is but it that felt like that ending and that build-up really don't connect to each other Mm -hmm. i don't know if you have more on that but it felt it felt like a big missed opportunity there were a lot of missed the whole movie was a missed opportunity it really was Let's drag it back a little bit while still talking about the ending. So I want to talk about specifically the like climactic moment where Davy Jones stabs Will and then Elizabeth and Jack have Will like they like puppet hand Will to stab the heart. So that is like I didn't used to have a problem with that moment, but now I really, really do. Because they made this, like, perfect situation where none of the characters have to choose anything. Right. And I didn't think of this when we talked about it the first time, but it really is the same problem, I think, that we had with Ready or Not with Alex. Like, everything leading up to that could have stayed the same. Not that it should have, but it could have stayed the same. And you just make one of them choose to stab the heart and take one for the team Mm -hmm. like i don't understand why that didn't happen because Mm -hmm. it would have just made it so much stronger and there's so many reasons for them to do it like in that moment when jack is hesitating and he's like you know he has davy jones's heart and is like you know threatening to stab it why is he waiting he wanted immortality right well and and see that is a thing in it too because if it was a struggle for him and he was being indecisive about it, like, then create a a situation that pressures him to choose more. And Will getting stabbed is not that situation. Nope. Will being threatened might be. Because the the moment that that Will goes from, from being alive to being dead, now, of course, they have to have him do it just to save him. Mm -hmm. And also, another problem with that is, why do they have him stab it with that, like, sword when... He always promised to stab it with the knife that he got from his dad, which is right there, and he just, like, leaves it. Like, I don't think it would have been that strong, but you're having, like, a symbolic object stabbing a symbolic object. Why do you not do that? It's not a prophecy, per se, but it's a promise that he intended to keep, and that would have been, like, a thing where he's like, you know, I'm gonna stab the heart with this, and then he actually does stab the heart with it. I don't understand why this was the ending they wanted. You know what would have been cool, I think? What if Elizabeth stabs the heart in that scene? Yeah. Not with that exact situation with Will being dead, yeah. but, like, that almost feels like a better ending to me. I don't really know why. Her being a pirate, I mean, at least that's more interesting. Yeah. Permanently a pirate. Yeah, or Will choosing to do that, because, you know, at the beginning of the first movie, he's, like, aggressively anti-pirate. Then by stabbing the heart as a choice it would make him like have a full arc and embrace being a pirate and i think that's what they wanted like he comes back from the dutchman in like full pirate getup yeah they're visually trying to show us like he's a pirate now if elizabeth would have stabbed it she would have had like a lot of title like daughter of the ex-governor pirate king pirate lord Um, and uh new davy jones i don't know what his job title is captain of the dutchman yeah like i don't know if he's supposed to be the devil or not i've I've never quite understood that like a grim reaper he's supposed to guide the souls to the wherever the souls are supposed to go that was really unclear as well like 
Wait, okay. I didn't understand this either. So they got Jack back from the dead off a of beach because apparently that's where the punished go. He was the only one on the island, though. So they got him. It was just like, first of all, how the hell did they get there? Yeah, they fell off the quote-unquote edge of the earth. So, like, you're telling me the dead are, are just, like, in a different part of the world? Like, what what sense does that make? And they just brought him back. They were just like, hey, here's his... There wasn't anything about souls or spirits or anything. Tia Dom, I know, mentioned his soul was taken as well with the Kraken or whatever. And I was like, okay, so we're going to see him in some place. Maybe they got to do a ritual or something in order to get him back. They were just like, nope. Go to where he, he, death is a location on this planet in this mythos. Death is a location, so let's just well, go I don't get think him. It's meant, you're meant to think of it as a physical location. It's That's like, exactly they, what it looked like. Because well, then he, I mean, of he course rides, it looks like that, but he, like, he rides the ship that I wasn't sure was his imagination or not because he was effed up. And yeah. then he rides the ship on the crabs and the ship falls into the sea. And he's just like, all right, let's get out of, let's get out of limbo. Like, what? And then what confused me even further was the governor, ex-governor. Well, he he was the ex-governor, right? Kind of. I don't know if he ever got stripped never, of his title, but clear. Governor Swan. Yeah, sure. He was riding by on the dinghy. He was like, all right, Elizabeth, I'm so proud of you. I'm going to tell your mother I'm proud of you, too. I'm going to tell her you're doing well. And he, he just kept floating on the thing and then there was the shot where more boats were revealed and i was just like what where are they going they said to he said to ride the sea in eternity how is he gonna find the mother in the sea of eternity well i mean odds are they'd bump into each other at some point (laughs) in eternity later yeah It, it is not fully fleshed out world building for sure though and then Elizabeth is trying to get him, and Tia Dawn was like, no, she can't leave the ship. But y'all left the ship when you crash-landed in limbo, didn't you? Like, Yeah, that's true. What? I never, I never thought of that as a contradiction. I guess I always just took it as a given, like, I guess if they're here, the water is dangerous, and they're like, if we stay too long, we're going to permanently die or whatever. Then nobody looked dead, Evan. Yeah, and the thing that's really selling it for me is... When they say, like, oh, we're out of rum and water. Well, if you're actually dead, why do you need to, like, sustain yourself physically? Right. Because it doesn't seem like Jack did. So, I mean, yeah. he was licking stuff. I don't know why, because it wasn't... He was I think because be Johnny dead. Depp, honestly, is the answer. He was supposed to be dead. Like, if he's dead, why is he trying to eat? Like, that That was so confusing. He was eating. So how did he end up in limbo and then was just taken out of limbo like he was like he was given a new body or something like, bro, I'm trying to look at it from a world like you said, world building perspective. And that makes no damn none of that made any damn sense to me. I thought it was going to be way more interesting than hey, let's go. Yeah, it. Now that you're mentioning that, I really feel like the priority with this movie was take advantage of the budget and do like the three big water stunt moments where they're going over the edge of the earth, the up is down scene where they flip the boat and then the maelstrom that feels like what they wanted to do. They spent way too long with him in limbo too. That could have been cut down at least by 10 minutes in the very least 10 minutes, like him talking to himself and Mm -hmm. the first hour of the movie has a lot more extra time than it needs to yeah and you know in a three-hour movie that's everything precious time yeah everything needs to be useful to the plot in a three-hour movie because that or at least like you'd want it there and i think like i used to enjoy the scene with the multiple jacks like seeing johnny depp mess around with other johnny depps is kind of fun the first time you see it at least i thought it was Maybe that was the point where we realized there is such a thing as too much Johnny Depp. Yes. But yeah, it it does feel like a waste. So to bring it back to like the ending with just why it maybe is a problem. Like, I don't think it's that far off from what it maybe should have been. 
like if you have will if you have the the characters end up where they do at the end that's not a bad thing in itself but it's why they get there that is the problem i think because there's not really a good why it's like really it it, it again i think goes back to robbing them of choice you know mm-hmm. just to kind of close out this topic like i think what happened with this and feel free to disagree with me but i think the reason the movie ended up the way it did is because anytime they saw a plot hole or something that they needed to justify they solved just that problem it was never taking a look at what is happening in the movie as a whole like what I think they should have done is maybe written two more drafts of this, gone back and done another iteration and be like, okay, what is a better way to combine all these elements? Because I think the elements that are here are good elements. You know, I know you're kind of trashing on Tia Dalma being Calypso and all that, but, you know, they clearly wanted that from the second movie. If you go back and watch the scene where they introduce her, you see that they knew right away that she was calypso i did not i might have to i know you you probably didn't see it the first time i don't think you're meant to but like if you go back and watch that scene that's not good i'm sorry fair fair (laughs) enough but like you can tell that their intention was always she is calypso and i think it's okay to tie her in i think it's okay to have the whole brethren court thing and even having like the maelstrom battle at the end all of those things are okay elements themselves they just mix them in a way that really did not work well yeah they what they needed to do was instead of making a new treaty anytime they realized there was a problem they could have taken it back and been like okay let's maybe cut it down to like a few major things that happen and make it a lot simpler yeah like if they had restructured the whole thing they could have solved all of the individual problems that I think is like a major writing lesson to take from this is like, take a look at your whole story instead of just being like, Oh, this is a problem. All right. I'll write a scene to fix this. No rework the whole thing. If that's a problem and fit it in a better way, it's going to be harder, but it will be worth your time. That's the takeaway I have from this. So, yeah. Uh, anything else on the confusingness of this and, like, the bad ending? There's probably going to be more, but not right now. Okay, fair enough. I mean, I wouldn't expect that you've found all the issues with it having just watched it, like, an hour ago. And there's a lot more to find. Oh, one thing I want to return to real quick, just because it came up sort of at one point. So... That scene where the Kraken is on the beach and Jack and Barboza are there. So I never really thought of this, but theoretically, depending on how long the, it takes the Kraken to digest, Jack is standing like 10 yards away from his own corpse in that scene. Oh, yeah. I never really thought of that. And of course, it might not be true, but it might. I don't know. I thought that was worth mentioning. Wait. That that Kraken was on the beach of the Limbo, right? Limbo? No, no, that was in that was in the real world. That was like a little bit after they got back. Oh. So he did just come back and it so oh my god, that <laughs> that's what's effing with me, man. So if he died inside the Kraken, who gave him a new body in Limbo? And he why was respawned. his soul Yeah he respawned. <laughs> I guess I that well, with, with you put it when you put it like that, it makes perfect sense. But Video nobody's going to say respawn in this game or in this in the this game, game, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's like when you yeah when you die in team deathmatch, you come back and you pick up your old weapon and you see your, your old dead body from the last time you died. Yeah, exactly. It's just like a video game. I don't know. I, I know that doesn't actually answer your question. I mean, for their story wise, no, but. The way you compared it kind of makes sense. I don't know if that's canon or not. To uh, yeah, I don't know if there's such a thing as, like, Pirates canon. I don't think it has that kind of fan base. I hope not. I want to make a canon pun right now, but nothing's coming to mind. Oh, no. <laughs> um, 
one final thing on the Kraken while we're touching on it. I wanted more Kraken in this, but I actually do like it better that it dies the way it does. It's Evan. disappointing that I stand by this. No, statement. no, no, no. How cool would it have been if the Kraken was in the Maelstrom scene, Evan? That would have been the coolest thing ever. Like, okay, not the coolest thing ever, but it would have been absolutely awesome. Evan. Kraken Maelstrom. Okay, now I'm even more disappointed. They so should have done that. They just killed the Kraken off screen. The the monster that was a beast in the second movie was killed off screen. I know, and I am disappointed there wasn't more Kraken, but I, I still... You're making it harder for me to stand by my statement. But I do stand by it that I would rather have the Kraken die off screen than have it die being lame. Got it. And have the heroes defeat it in a way that didn't feel consistent to like how badass the Kraken is. I think they get as close as possible. At the end of Dead Man's Chest, I think they get as close as is possible to killing it. Mm-hmm. And I'd rather it maintain that status of being like so unstoppable as much as I want more Kraken. Mm. It at least isn't lame. And I think that mm. that's the only way it would have been able to die off screen because like, unless you bring in like some other sea monster to kill it, which is basically the whole plot of like that Godzilla movie from last year. King of the Monsters? Yeah. I saw that. I have seen clips. I kind of thought about seeing it, but like... It was a really cool kaiju movie. But other than that, I don't think anybody has ever cared about humans in those movies. Yeah, I I wonder why they even bother at a certain point. Like, nobody is there to see that. Just make the monsters fight. Yeah. Make it like UFC or something. Godzilla vs. Mothra this week in the theaters. Okay, a month from now, we got Godzilla vs. King Kong heavyweight title match. Something like that. That sounds like the biggest budget YouTube series ever. I don't know what they're going to do with Godzilla vs. Kong, but I also haven't seen any of the movies leading up to it, so I don't care. Only one I haven't seen was the original, well, not original, but the new first Godzilla. I saw Kong Skull Island and I saw the King of Monsters, but I didn't see the first Godzilla. Odd how I saw the second movie without seeing the first, but the second movie filled me in with really, like, three lines of dialogue as to what happened in the first. I was like, oh, well... Didn't need to see. I don't expect that you missed much. It was probably, I, I think I heard there's like barely any Godzilla in the first one. They never like is in the they first basically one. show as much of him in the actual movie as they did in the trailer. Yep, or something. Well, that's what I'm assuming. I yeah. can't confirm it. But moving on. Sorry. Yeah. Anyway, the Kraken is cool. I want more of him, but I'd rather like I'm okay with this ending. So this oh, next God. topic. God. is oh my God. yes i see you're reading ahead no this has been a long time coming it's highlighted in gray oh because that's it's not death. symbolic of anything it's death evan <laughs> oh my God. This okay this to, topic just to fill you with what death. we're talking about we're talking about will and elizabeth's relationship which yes i've highlighted in gray on the google doc that's not meant to be symbolic of anything death and depression and garbage wow i really did <laughs> set that up as like yep they they have a very lackluster relationship oh, i see the clarity now lackluster it has no color it Nothing it really it. does not so no shine i i have a feeling you're uh you're you're gonna have a lot of jabs to make with this i, I kind of meant to mention this when we did the first one so in like seventh grade, I think I watched the first movie, or at least part of it, with a friend. And there's that scene where like we first see Will and Elizabeth as adults, and they like say hi, and he's like, "Oh, good day, Elizabeth." And then my friend goes, oh, "They like each other," and he was just kind of kidding, like in the moment. Mm-hmm. But literally, that's all they do the entire three movies is like basically there's that moment. Nothing. There's there yeah. really is nothing. The reason that I think we don't feel any connection between the two of them is, and it's it's not the only reason, but it's the only one that I think I can like articulate, is we never get to see them just kind of exist together. Like, I don't think they have more than like six scenes 
in the entire trilogy with just the two of them together. And that's kind of a problem. And in a way, for the plot of all those movies, it makes sense to separate them. But if you're going to do that, you need a moment where it's not just, oh, they like each other. Like, it's got to be, oh, they actually have something. There's nothing earned about them. They're just two attractive people exactly. that are forced story-wise to be attracted to each other because there's literally no other lady in the series. Everyone else in the movie has, like, no teeth. Yeah, <laughs> so that too. It's it's kind of like... Process you know. of elimination. That's like when, yep. when Nebula said in Endgame, your choices were either him or a tree. Like, it, it's kind of like that. Yeah, and, like, they... I, I think we're getting to a point now where, like, you can have a movie or an action movie without a romantic subplot. Yeah. 2003 was definitely not that time. 2007 was still not that time. I don't remember which which movie I saw where I was expecting the characters to, like, make out or something at the end. But I remember thinking, wait, why are they not together? They, It was a male protagonist and a female protagonist. What, uh... What's going on here? And then as I got older, I started to appreciate that more and more. Like Where it's like, yeah, of course, all they've done is punch other things side by side for for two hours. Right. Like They have nothing in common besides punching. Right. I think Blade did that. The second Blade or third Blade did that. Or the first one. I don't remember which Blade did it, okay? I don't remember the Blade movies. I haven't but, seen any of them, so I can't help you there. But yeah, there was a. It was Blade and another female protagonist, and the person I saw it in a review, and the person reviewing, I think it was Nostalgia Critic, was like, "Okay, go ahead. You aren't a uh, movie. You make them kiss now, because all movies back then uh, needed felt the need to do that." And they kind of just was like, "All right, appreciate you. See you on on a rooftop <laughs> at the end of the movie." And it was like almost setting it up, but they just kind of said, "Nope." They were like, all right, appreciate your help. Peace. I almost feel like that's... Okay, actually, no. That's not worse. Because, like, I think it's okay to, to like, have a connection between, like, two characters that's not romantic. That's a good thing to have in a movie. Mm -hmm. But it, like, also, they all... Like, those relationships also tend to not have chemistry. So it's, like, in an emotional sense, you're giving us the same thing just without, like, the trailer shot of them kissing basically which i'm fine with if they have nothing in common romantically or yeah pretty don't much force it. yeah it. don't yeah and I, I think you can tell like when it works and when it doesn't like one of my favorite on-screen relationships and i think one of yours is the andrew garfield and emma stone oh god yes spider-man and gwen stacy like they have so much chemistry they were dating during the movie but even without that but even without that, there are moments that they that are written into that movie where it's just the two of them kind of being together and you're like, okay, like, yeah, there's something here. And that's why that relationship works so well. And I think we both want to talk about those movies someday, so maybe we'll oh, save yeah, we some of that. should add that to the list. Is that on the list? Yeah, if it's not, we need to add it. That's something where they... And even... I know we both hate it, but even... The 2002 Raimi version, there yeah. are moments in that, like, there's still not chemistry there between the actors, but there are moments where we have Peter Parker and MJ together being awkward, but at the very least, you can say that on paper there's a relationship there. Will and Elizabeth don't have a moment like that at all. I think one of the most telling scenes is the last scene with. Elizabeth on the Black Pearl saying goodbye to all the pirates. Oh, yeah! She was about she... to make out with Jack! Well, yes, that too, but also... <laughs> that's its own thing. But also, like, all of those characters, like, Pintel and Rigetti are like, oh, goodbye, puppet. And yeah. then Barboza says, Mrs. Turner, like, referencing that thing, like, how we called her miss oh, turner when they first I met like it's a call back to that and then jack referencing like oh no once is quite enough mm -hmm. like their kiss at the end of dead man's chest that ended up killing him like there is something that can be referred back to with all three of those characters 
what is that moment with her and Will? I don't think it exists. Him breathing on her leg. That was Which is something. in the last minute of them being together. That was like something, wasn't it? He was they felt a connection, yeah. spiritual connection from being in oh, an yeah. island and the leg breathing it went from his, her shin to her knee. Yeah, it wasn't the wedding. That was when they knew it was real. <laughs> oh my god, the wedding. Bro, Evan, don't get me started, bro. Oh, I'm about to pop off on this movie right now, bro. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Oh go ahead. my god. <sighs> okay, first of all, when I'm not expecting or when I'm... Like, for some reason, my heart skipped a beat when he said, Elizabeth, will you marry me? In the middle of the fight, my heart skipped a beat and I said, What? <laughs> like I like that like it was a jump scare from a horror movie. I was Wait, so really? confused in that moment. Like physically I reacted. <laughs> I was so confused when that happened. I I thought during this the course of this movie, across all three movies, I could never tell whether you two actually liked each other. Unless they say it at the end, or you're just I mean, stupidly smiling like, at each other. Their their eyes are bright and and they're smiling, so you know they must. She has made out with every must. major character in this movie besides Barbosa and and the villains. She made Not out with Commodore. Quite, close, close. She made out with Commodore before he died. She made out with Jack before she killed him. So maybe she just had the kiss of death and maybe Will is really just the only one for her. Maybe that's what they're trying to say. Like, she's death to every dude she makes out with. And, and even even Will was dead. Will was, Will was technically dead. I'd never noticed that pattern. You're right, though. Like, all three of those characters die within, like, a minute after they, they kiss her. Yeah. Sao Fang, um, Jack, Oh, yeah, she did kiss Sao Fang, too, bro. <laughs> Oh my god, I think you may have just cracked this. Oh my god. <laughs> and Will was technically dead. How many times did she make out with him? They cut his heart out. He was dead. I mean, he's technically immortal now, but he's like a zombie, technically it speaking. A, it, it, it took a little more. It took a little more for him. <laughs> um, it, took, it took getting married for him to actually lose his plot armor. But, oh um, and, and even then, not really... The, wow. Wait, let me go back to the wedding. Okay, so I physically reacted like it was a damn jump scare because I did not see that coming because they had expressed nothing to each other. The entire trilogy. I was going to say movie. The entire trilogy. And I'm Although like, also the entire movie. Yeah. <laughs> where is this coming from? Where is this coming from? And then she agreed. She agreed. She was like, he said, will you marry me? And her next line was Barbosa, not yes. It was Barbosa. No, her next line is, I don't think that was the best oh, time. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That first. That first. <laughs> Which, I don't think... totally fair. And then, like, I, I think that was a moment that they wanted also. Like, the wedding in the middle of a battle scene, which is cool at face value. Not when it's not earned. It's not earned, but they, they clearly, like, choreograph that scene. Also, Hans Zimmer carries that scene with the music. Mm. like go back and listen to that too because like or i know you don't want to go rewatch the scene but no, rewatch it and just listen to Hans zimmer's score there we're going to talk about him in a bit mm -hmm. because he must be talked about he just has a library of just bangers yes but like he carries that wedding scene like take away the score there and it's just like it wouldn't work keep going if you have more on the wedding scene yeah so then Barbosa's like, I'm a little busy, and he's trying to fight the pirates off, and then they say their vows, and he doesn't even say you may kiss the bride or or you're now happily married or whatever. He he just says just kiss. I don't I don't know if that made it official. I don't care if it made it official. <laughs> None of that made sense. And then they made out in the middle of the battle scene, and all of a sudden they just have all of this room around them with it's like a circle, perfect circle of people fighting around them, but from a good distance away. So they have a perfect shot of them making out like this was an earned scene. And I, I wanted 
Evan, this is this is bad when I wanted this to happen for the movie and the entire trilogy. In that moment, I just thought, somebody stab both of them. Please. Please. Yeah. I know it was not going to happen because it's Disney and they don't kill their protagonist unless it's a parent. <laughs> um, oh, very true. Very true. So... In that, mo- and then I thought just now I thought if somebody would have stabbed them, that that would only happen in a spoof movie, and in those spoof movies, those are just not clever or funny. But in that moment, I really, really wanted both of them to just die. I wanted them to be stabbed in the back. I did not care for either one of them across any of these movies and the fact that they were thrown together because they were both two good looking people made this even worse and that ki- that kissing scene I I was hoping Davy Jones somebody stabbed both of them maybe both of them at once like a freaking shish kebab like through the through mm-hmm. the wheels back and through Elizabeth's front and like make the sword come like out they do back. to the pirates yeah, in, um, in the, the black final Pearl. battle of them mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. please somebody and and their suffering because clearly they don't care enough about themselves to be marrying each other yeah yeah there's there's <sighs> issues the thing that really stuck out to me in this is they have not talked since the end of dead man's chest I think there's a line to confirm that. But, like, also, before that happened, I think, it, like, there was one moment where, like, they looked at each other and you could just tell, like, they have not worked out any of the problems that have come up with each other. There's, like, three times, I think, that Will betrays Elizabeth and maybe vice versa, too. Although I'm not sure. That never gets addressed. And, like, Will is kind of choosing between his father and and elizabeth and they acknowledge that choice and then there's a scene where elizabeth's kind of like oh it's okay like i get it it's a losing battle but i was like why don't they make that more of a choice for him that could have been played up but also why is she okay with that (laughs) like choosing his father over her yes yeah like his father who he he like doesn't know very well which granted is probably why he wants to save him in part but it seems like there is so much for them to be in conflict about. And, like, that scene where Will gets traded for Jack, the island scene you were talking about a while back, mm-hmm. after that scene, everything's cool with them. But I'm pretty sure between, like, the last time they saw each other and at that point, there was a lot that Will had done that she could have been legitimately pissed about. Like, yeah, they were about to go to war against each other were it not for that trade. There were so many... Like, it's a bad thing for your quote-unquote romance couple when I cannot tell at any point in the movie if they are romantically still romantically interested in one another. Like, when I saw them interact for the first time in this movie, I thought, wait, do they hate each other in this moment? Or, like, did they're they... just kind of confused? They're like, oh, like, yeah. I mean, the plot says we should be together, but, well, I don't know. <laughs> like, I-, I thought she was like, she was going to be pissed off at him for something, or I thought he was going to be mad at her for something. I don't know what I thought. Like, I. The fact that I'm confused shows how much they they just don't didn't need to they had a kid they had a kid and the father's out at this that's even worse you got to think about that they have they mm-hmm. have a 10-year-old and the father is not in the picture for 10 years and then one day out of those 10 years he comes back say hey champ you doing all right okay 10 years old all right i'll see you in another 10 years comes back yep. hey champ 20 years old you off to old english ye old english college that's what's up all right i'll be back when you're 30 <laughs> you when you're probably married and have your own kids i'm looking forward to being a grandfather if not i'll be back when you're uh when you're 40 yeah well also he in that time will have spent the first 40 years with his own dad so maybe something happens then. I don't know. Like, I hadn't even thought about him, them parenting. Like, 
that brings a whole nother level to it. I actually was thinking this time that their separation at the end is, is kind of perfect because maybe it's the only way that their relationship can survive. I don't think it should survive. I think the relationship should be thrown off of a cliff and then struck by lightning. Harsh, but they're fictional characters, so... Here's the thing, though. Like, in the first two movies, especially the first one, I think it's okay that they don't do a lot with their relationship in the first one. But the problem is, if you're going to try to convince us that they have this, like, epic romance together then you actually need something there. Like, there's never a sense that the two of them actually, like... Like, they never even reference, like, some time from their past, except for the meeting scene that's the very opening of the first movie. Did the actors like, hate each other? I don't remember I don't if you told me that last time. I don't but know, I... but in in any case, it's not there textually. I don't really feel a lack of chemistry between the actors. I feel a lack of any effort put into their relationship in the story. It might have been a little bit of a cheap thing, but maybe reference something that happened in between the first movie and the second movie. Like, Elizabeth mentions, like, Will taught me how to how to use a sword. Okay, maybe have a moment in a fight scene where he references some move for her to do, or they practice some choreographed fight dance, like, at the ending, where they've actually, like, they have something that they've done together. Like, it's something has to be there. Nope. Apparently not, but, like, something should be there. <laughs> Somehow I bought it <gasps> as a kid. Oh. But, yeah. <laughs> um, but the podcast, I, I, guess, I guess it's maybe not so surprising because, like we were saying, it's just, like, it, it always does happen that, like, the hot guy and the hot girl will get together by the end of the movie. And unfortunately, that's a trend that has not totally gone away, although I think we're moving away from it a bit. Maybe this is confirmation that it shouldn't be a trend anymore. If you're going to have a relationship in your movie, actually put in some damn effort. Like, <laughs> that's the lesson from this. Do you have more? <laughs> no, I'm exhausted. My, I'm physically exhausted. After I'm a little bit exhausted too. myself. I... I didn't expect that to happen, but, well, it did. Okay, so let's move on to... Something better. Yeah. The best thing about this movie. Hans mother freaking Zimmer. This guy is just... Every note in this movie is where it should be, I think. The only time I noticed, and I'm sorry, to, sad to say this, but only time I noticed the... Uh, and I did add parlay to my watch later list on YouTube... But the um, only time I noticed the music was with the, the theme being played. Or whenever Jack Sparrow was doing something, his, his theme being played. Mm. But that, that was no fault of his. That was because normally when I don't notice the music in a movie, I'm either invested in the movie or not paying attention. And this was the latter. Mm. So Yeah, it's. I'm not going to say you should definitely like at it but this is a like the score for all three of these is really good and in this one they actually don't use the one everyone knows from the first two they use that song at the beginning that all the people going to hang sing they use the melody from that in a really cool way i don't think i noticed that the first time what was I saw that it. what's that song from the, the the one you're talking about in the beginning yeah i think that's an original for this movie oh. i'm pretty sure that's not a thing from anything else the song was dope but then the kid died and i was like <laughs> <laughs> so uh, want me to cut that out <laughs> no no it, it's it's fine because i i laugh at how dark thing like i'm not because i wasn't invested in this series at all I sometimes find really dark things really funny because like you said, like when we mentioned it before, it's when it's trying to be that type of edginess, I can't help but laugh. Like somebody dying in a horrific way, like when Davy Jones strangled that one dude with his te face tentacles, mm -hmm. just like looking on, like not watching the movie from like a viewer's perspective, just somebody wrote that in like and then the kid hangs like 
and, and then Davy Jones strangles the guy with his face tentacles. Like, that's... Looking at it from a writer's perspective, that's just hilariously dark and effed up. I know it's effed up. That's what makes me uh, okay. sane. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't questioning that, to yeah. be clear. <laughs> um, anyway, Hans Zimmer, with this score, does, like... He takes that song and uses it throughout the whole movie mm. in a way that I think is really good. It's not that similar to the score from the first two movies, which in a way, like, I kind of would have liked having the main Pirates theme playing at the end of this just at face value. But the music in this is really good. Like, I, I mean, of course. Like, <laughs> it's Hans Zimmer. Yeah, it's Hans Zimmer, of course. It's going to be good. I like that we he both has movies under his belt that we both enjoy. Like, yes. well, your favorite oh, being many. Inception. Yeah. And Interstellar and, well, there's just tons. But my favorite track list being either The Amazing Spider-Man 2 or um, Man of Steel. Yeah, for sure. And, like, I'm not a fan of Man of Steel, but I do love that soundtrack. Hans might be one of the only things that I have nice to say about that. I haven't seen it in a while, so maybe that's not true, but just warning you. Yeah, like, literally, not a note in this trilogy is out of place. And I've listened to these soundtracks a bunch of times, and I'm not a music person, so maybe someone, like, feel free free to disagree on this, but, like, even if you don't like one of these movies, like, really good score yes that that cannot be denied we could say more but like we'd just be repeating like han zimmer is the best basically for another yeah, few yeah, minutes we, we get it he, he's he was the he's best awesome. part of these movies for me yeah yep he was the best part so this is like the first series that we've ever done on the show and these three movies as i think we have seen are very different from each other in a lot of ways so i want to take a few minutes and look at the entire trilogy and say like what are we taking away from it It, mostly from like a storytelling perspective i mean that's what i have i don't i don't feel like there's a whole lot of life lessons embedded in these i would not follow any of those life lessons i mean don't be an asshole (laughs) is a good one Um, well that's just that's kind of a given a life lesson from yeah like don't screw people over don't be a pirate kind of, or be a pirate i don't know what the it, it is a little thematically confused in some things i, I think that the theme of the second one don't be a commodore. works pretty well and like the theme of the first one like we talked about like i don't think it's the greatest theme but i think the the first movie does a good job with conveying that theme and like yeah, the second one I think is it has the strongest theme to it. But do you have anything? And I know you just recently finished this trilogy, so it might be a little early to ask. But do you have anything, any like takeaways you feel like this series offers? Build on your romantic relationships if you know you're gonna end up having the two characters. If they knew, like they knew from the very first they movie, that Will and Elizabeth. We're going to be together. They should have known to build on that. And not have yeah. her make out with every other dude that she saw. Yeah, they should have they, they should have scheduled in some time for them to actually work on their relationship. That is, yeah, um, we've, we've, we've killed, said we've that a lot. We've killed that and set it on fire and then buried it. Yeah, just to build on, just because that was going to be one of my takeaways too, is like, you can't just say these two people have a relationship you have to right. show it because that that holds true beyond them too i think in this like that holds true for will and his father you know they and granted there's not a whole lot there because they don't really know each other but if you're gonna have will be so passionate about saving his father maybe give them a moment too when they first meet where it's like oh I've been missing having a father in my life and have us feel that, or I've been missing having a son in my life. Because I think the two of them believe that, but there's never a moment where we feel that. Now that I think about it, was there any good relationship across this trilogy? I mean, I feel like the relationships that characters have with Jack, they aren't, like, emotionally resonant, but they feel correct. No, I mean, like... a 
emotionally. Like, I feel like Calypso and Davy Jones' relationship was more believable than Will and Elizabeth. Yeah, which is, is not a good thing. That I Jack, mean, it's good that they spent a little time working on it, but... Jack and his damn father done. had a better relationship than those two. Yeah. Well, that's also helped a little bit of trivia that most people who have seen this might know. Jack's father is played by Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones because he was kind of an inspiration for the Jack Sparrow character to begin with. It's like an homage. So that was, yeah. I don't I don't know if that was a reference that people would have noticed like nope. when they saw it in theaters in 07, but I know that's been pointed out by many people. Maybe that's why they actually bothered with them. And you're probably going to disagree with this. I think there is a little development with Elizabeth and Governor Swan. Yes. I don't think that's a very that's okay. strong relationship. It was but better, there are moments. Yeah. There are moments where they have Dear old Daddy. Yep. Yeah, I felt I felt They that at least a have bit. scenes with each other. Sorry yeah, I felt you. that they at least had scenes with each other. I felt that that were about their relationship. With with him dying and her trying to chase him off the ship, I felt that was way more earned. Yeah. Yeah, that was way more earned. Lessons from the entire uh write a complete ending for your trilogy if you know it's gonna be a trilogy. I mean they had two more movies after this, but this was supposed to like mark an end of a overarching story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think to be fair, they didn't necessarily know it was gonna be a trilogy when they wrote the first one. Mm -hmm. But as we said in the Dead Man's Chest episode, they absolutely knew there was going to be a third movie mm -hmm. when they wrote that one. Oh, yeah. I feel like they were already in production by the time that, first, that second one rolled around for the third. I think that's almost for sure. I don't know that factually, but I would be surprised if that wasn't true. I don't know. I'm exhausted from tearing this movie apart. Okay. So. I have a few other lessons I see as takeaways. One is... If you make something enjoyable, there is an extent to which its flaws can be forgiven. I think that holds true in the second movie the most, because, like we said, Dead Man's Chest is not perfect from, like, a structural standpoint. But I can tell that the writers and director wanted and really cared about some moments in that, like the three-way sword fight and the Kraken, and I also enjoy those moments a lot. So if they had to do some, some maneuvering to get there, I'm okay with that. I think that's true of a lot of people's reaction to Endgame. Like, I think you've said this before. Like, you don't really care much for the first half of Endgame, or at least, like, maybe the first two hours. But it has such a good payoff that it's worth it. I think you're not the only person I've heard say that about Endgame, and that's kind of my feeling with it, too. So that, I think, is a takeaway. Like, not that it should be where you start, but if something is fun, you can get away with not doing all the story work for it. Not that that's something you should do, but it's something that maybe is worth knowing. Mm -hmm. Second takeaway, and this is kind of tied in, it's okay to be complex, but there should be something underneath that, like something satisfying. It's one of the reasons I love Inception so much is that that's a very complicated movie. But there are reasons, like once you unpack it all, you're like, oh, I see it. Whereas with this movie, like we didn't even try to unpack the complications because, you know, it doesn't lead to anything satisfying. We know there's not really anything there. It doesn't feel like the writers were even trying to unpack it themselves. I think they probably did try, but I think at a certain point someone just said, we got to make this. Mm -hmm. like, And to build off of that, this isn't so much a writing lesson. This is more like a studio thing that I hope that studios do. Give people time to write. At, at this point, I don't see how... Yeah, I forgot Disney might have cut the writing thing short. Yeah, and... They clearly haven't learned their lesson because look at Rise of Skywalker. I know you haven't seen it yet. I know. But it's, I've heard it's a hot pile of trash. 
Yep, it is. And I, I was feeling so, like this was the first time I'd seen this since Rise of Skywalker. And I felt some of those same vibes here. I was like, man, you can tell that they were like trying to make this on a very tight schedule. Like in Rise of Skywalker, what they do is like anytime the plot needs to go somewhere, they're like, okay, introduce a new character, introduce a new MacGuffin and have them do another side quest. And that's not the case here, but I think just swap that out with introduce a new betrayal, introduce a new agreement between two people. And like, it really does not work. Mm -hmm. Another takeaway, like to tie it in with that, take the time to like figure out what is the best setup for this story. Like for all the things that are said about structure models, like, and like even on our show, they can be a little bit basic. It can feel tiring to like go through all of that, but it really is worth your time to figure out what version of the story is going to be best before you start writing it. That's something I'm doing right now. Like I've been talking with my, with one of my professors the past couple weeks and I want to start writing this thing, but from the conversations we're having, I know that it would be a waste of time because I'm not ready to yet. Like I need to find what the right version of this story is. And I think watching at world's end has been a great thing to remind me of like what the consequences of not doing that can be. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're good at it though, you sound like a planner. There are planners and there's pantsers, Evan. And then there's something in the middle I like to call Plantser, where you do both. Yeah, and that's that I think is a constant struggle f- with writing that is hard to see sometimes. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of been one of my arguments for trying to write this. I'm like, maybe if I write something, I'll find an element that will end up solving all of these story problems, but I, I won't do. find it until I write it. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so that's that's totally valid. But... I think if you can, it's a more efficient use of time if you can find those elements that you need. Especially on something phase. of this, yeah, this scale, mm-hmm. yeah. And especially because you have so much set up. Like, it, if you're starting something from scratch, you can mess around with as many elements of it as you want in mm-hmm. a lot of ways. Like, you can recreate new things. In the case of the second, and actually all of these movies, because it's based on IP. There are certain things you're like, okay, I have a limitation here. I'm starting with this. Only pirates. In that case, I think you absolutely should plan. And I I fully agree with you and like it wasn't really part of my original point, but I'm going to I'm going to add it on to it. Don't be afraid to take those things that as you say come like with the pants kind of writing like off the se- for those who don't know that's referencing like the phrase off the seat of your pants yeah improv. like yeah like something that you didn't really think was going to happen but it it works in the moment i think that would have worked so to connect it to myself a little bit i write dialogue based off of the characters that i know i'm writing so because i create all my characters i know what the characters are and what they might say in a moment so i can use both of their if there's like a two people talking i can use what i know about each character to see what how one would react to the other saying something in a moment and that's how i improvise my dialogue yeah and and that's i i think that's a really good strategy because you know it's dialogue it's Mm -hmm. not like the characters don't know what the other one's gonna say in a conversation of course you have like there should be kind of an improvisational feel to it because it's not planned yeah i I think that could have helped will and elizabeth's relationship some of that like improv for their dialogue you know oh they're a little Mm -hmm. cutesy here and they're talking about this thing here that has nothing to do with the plot but you're showing you know their relationship a little more which i'm fine with a dialogue i learned through school that dialogue is always supposed to it's always supposed to serve the plot in some way whatever they're talking about is always supposed I don't believe Mm -hmm. that's entirely true because as long as you're like showing uh or yeah developing the character further the characters further through dialogue 
that's fine as well. It doesn't have to be, oh, hey, Elizabeth, did you hear about uh, Davy Jones' chest? That's We got to go get that. Oh, well, that's so great you say that because I, I think we should go get that as well. Cool. Yeah, you don't want the yeah. exposition to feel like exposition. Right. But I, I think to tie it back, something you said earlier, you were saying like, I have a sense of my characters well that enough too. that I can just kind of write dialogue off the cuff. And I don't know what your process is, but I would expect that before you can get to the point where you can write that dialogue off the cuff, you have to do a lot of work with those characters. Exactly. You have to take the time to do that. Yep. And that's something where if you rush something into production, granted, these are established characters that didn't we really have, two have a movies. lot of... Yeah. Like, so they wouldn't have, like, that's not, like, they should have had a sense of how they talked before this third movie. But you need to take that time. Yeah, and you don't even, like, now that I'm thinking about it, you don't even really know what their personalities are. They're just bland. How do you improv some something for a character you don't know anything about? And that leads into another point I was going to make, which is that you need to make your characters have personalities and motivations. Mm -hmm. Both are important because, like, I think these movies are such a good example of that because personality without motivation is, I think, Jack in, like, the later movies. Mm -hmm. Even really Jack in the third movie. Like, there's a lot... Like, that whole bit with him in Davy Jones' locker, there's no, like, motivation there. That's just Johnny Depp being Johnny Depp. Pretty much for a little bit Weird and you know stuff. Oh. that can be fun but you can't make a whole movie of johnny depp being johnny depp that was charlie and the chocolate factory i haven't actually ever seen that yeah but that i was, believe it i liked it i liked it as a child it's pretty intriguing. i was not allowed to see that as a kid really but i read the books yeah there was some reason that was like taboo among like parents in my parents circle for whatever reason I still haven't ended up seeing it, so I don't know. We should add that to the list. Well, I don't maybe, know if you know. No, yeah, I don't know. No, it, it, it. I, feel free. Like I, I love the book. Mm-hmm. So, like that was one of my favorite. Books Might want to ro- watch the. I haven't actually seen the. What was it, the Gene, old one? Gene, Gene Wilder. Gene Wilder. I was gonna say Gene. I watched that a lot as a kid. Yeah. Um, for some reason, we never owned it. But okay. I saw that a lot for some reason. Okay, so you did see the original. So yeah, to compare it. Might need to do a comparison episode or something. That might be a, a interesting thing to do, yeah. Yeah, I've never seen the 80s. You've never seen the remake, so. Okay, yeah, let's let's definitely earmark that. Anyway, back to, mm-hmm. like, personality without motivation, I don't think you can have. And, and, like, Jack Sparrow, I think, is a warning for that in a lot of ways. You also can't have the inverse, which is motivation without personality, because then you get Will and Elizabeth. You mm-hmm. need both. For it to be a character that feels real. Especially when it's a major character. Like, you know, Pintel and Brigetti don't need motivations. They're there for their personality. I know you don't like them. Oh, they're the duo? Yeah. You know, you didn't need them to be motivated. And in some cases, like, you don't necessarily need Beckett to have a personality. I think he does, at least more than some other characters. What is that, villain? His personality is villain. Fair enough. His his personality is generic, but it is there. <laughs> I mean, you, you can Ryan say that kind. it's uninspired, but it, it at least is there. I don't understand his death scene. Why would they, I don't they try to make that so beautiful? It's like the ship is exploding that ship around him. up looks gorgeous. The context around it, I don't know made what no sense. we're supposed to get from it. Like, that he just gives up. I feel like that should have been for a more deserving villain like a villain we were maybe rooting for or like davy jones or barbosa or barbosa yes and back in the first movie yeah barbosa has a good death in that i do wish we'd gotten more like badass davy jones in the oh this yeah third one he was great i may have already said that but mm-hmm. oh, i know you hate his accent but <sighs> bill nye he's so fun okay other takeaways 
focusing on theme is a, is a good thing that gives things direction i think the first two movies are a testament to that and the third one too because like they are trying a bit with a theme they may not be the best themes but i think when these movies are successful is when they are working in accordance with a theme mm-hmm. so that's a takeaway another takeaway try to make your plot and character work together we've talked a bit about how sometimes they're kind of clashing with each other and i think that's a constant struggle no matter what you're writing so i think a good takeaway for this is try to make them help each other instead of hurt each other i don't really know how to do that like not to say that i've never done it but i don't feel like i have a good technique for how to do that but i think it is something to strive for Mm -hmm. most of the time i don't know i try to find a balance i i let it's kind of like the the pl- whole planters thing, the combination mm-hmm. where I'm planning the plot out. I'll plan the plot out and what the characters are supposed to do for the sake of the story. And then, like, I'll balance that out by maybe changing some things around when I get to the actual writing. Because I'm getting into the minds of every character that I'm writing for that story. So I'm like, well, what's the decision would they actually make here? Like, I might have to end up changing something here or there. Mm-hmm. And I think it depends on what type of writing you're doing. Like, for yours, at least from what you've told me, you do a lot of long-form stories with your characters. So you have a little more room maybe to play around with, like, Mm -hmm. oh, they actually might not do this, so I'm not going to force them to. Mm -hmm. But when you're working with something, even as long as a trilogy, sometimes that's not enough time for you to make the character-specific choice. Like... Or at least it. Well, they had plenty of time in this damn three-hour movie, but yeah. Yeah, I think it's a constant struggle, but it's. I I think it's important to know what medium you're working in, whether you can afford to focus on plot or character. It's it's kind of a constant struggle, but they should help each other, although it's very hard to do that. I've found. Mm smaller lesson give characters interesting and specific ways to approach and deal with problems i think that comes up the most with like the main trio and i'm gonna add barbosa to it like i think something that is true throughout all three of these movies is these characters take character specific approaches to meeting their goals Mm. and i'm not gonna take the time to cite too many examples but i think that is something that this trilogy does pretty well i liked seeing barbosa alongside the protagonist in this i always like seeing the villain somehow find a way to become a part of the the main squad Hmm. like well this is an anime example but like vegeta joining goku and z fighters and dragon ball z Hmm. or I was thinking Loki in Avengers because I know that he, too. I haven't really seen him in the movies where he is like helping kind them. Of but I know up that with happens. Them in Ragnarok, a little bit of Ragnarok with get help and all that. Yeah, so I think having characters be specific in how they do things, not just what they do, is is a good takeaway. This is another one: making something functional, making something interesting, and making something entertaining are equally important things and i think this trilogy really offers a good spectrum for that because we have like the first movie is functional like i think it's a little bit hard to pick apart like oh this doesn't make sense you you aren't like paying off this thing everything's paid off the the first movie yeah like the rules but as you said and i agree with this that one is kind of boring like it's it's doing kind of the standard thing so it works and you know it's it's good but it's nothing amazing and i think that's kind of what's happened with marvel they're always making curse of the black pearl they never Mm. make dead man's chest and they Mm. probably never will i don't think at least not within the mcu wait what is dead man's chest in this analogy dead man's chest i think the reason why that one is my favorite is because it is kind of like it's not totally functional but it's functional enough and it's doing something interesting mm-hmm. they really pushed for some kind of non-traditional structure in that they got some moments in there that were really cool 
and mixed up like had an ensemble cast that worked together story-wise in sort of a different way a way that's been done a little more now but Mm. in a big movie i think it was sort not breaking new ground but I i would expect they had to fight for that a little bit and needed the success of the first movie to have permission to do it i think the lesson here is like do something interesting because you need to do something interesting for people to actually be interested but also you can't throw function and like actually telling a good story to the winds or else you get the third movie which is just chaos do you think the second movie would have been better or worse if barbosa was part of the protagonist like he was in the third movie oh i never thought of that yeah do you think it would have boosted it I think it could have, because he, if he wasn't the like main villain and still let Davy Jones shine as the main villain, then, yeah. I don't know. I'm not seeing... It's fun watching him, though. It is fun watching him. I'd be interested to see a version of it with him in it. I don't know how he would fit in. Right, I'm not, I'm saying excluding like how he died and everything in the first movie. Just having him be a part of the... Thing with the same motivations and all that like, yeah well, I, I mean i think the thing that's stopping me is i don't i don't understand how he would be incorporated if he didn't die in the mm-hmm. first movie because like that like if he doesn't die in the first movie that takes away like how all the other main characters enter the second movie mm. maybe it would be better though it it really might i think more barbosa would be good although he's in on Stranger Tides and uh, what was even the uh, Dead Men Tell No Tales is the fifth one, but I didn't see that, and uh, they don't really do as much with him as I recall. He's kind of checked out in those two, at least from what I've heard and remember. But that would be interesting. Yeah, just just to reiterate my lesson there, like I think it's a good idea to absolutely make some like try to do things that haven't been done before and do things that aren't expected because i don't think i don't think almost anything in dead man's chest is expected Mm -hmm. that's a movie that's hard to predict maybe a little too hard because some of the things come a little out of left field but it's doing interesting things and it kind of works like not fully but enough so you need like you should have both because with only one you're either going to be boring or you're going to be total chaos last little lesson Make your villains consistently powerful. If you're going to kill off the Kraken, don't do it in a lame way. Kraken has a weak spot. Somebody punch it. Exactly. That's basically Smaug and the Hobbit. But that's another conversation. <laughs> very, very good counterexample there <laughs> to the Kraken, I would say. But yeah, like, if you're going to make your villains powerful, like Davy Jones, and even Beckett, like, make them consistently powerful. Like, the ending of the third one where the entire armada just gives up it's like the armada could probably take them so it feels a little bit lame when they just are like oh we're giving up and granted the pirates have like control of the sea on their side now that will is the new davy jones but so maybe you can buy that but even so it's like you set up this entire legion of ships and then we just are expected to believe that they're going to back off. And that, like, don't do that. Do what they did with the Kraken if you can. Or, better yet, have the Kraken in the Maelstrom, like you were saying. And if they kill the Kraken, like, make it hard. As hard as it should be. They shouldn't have killed the Kraken anyway. I think it should have just been a force... Mm-hmm. Like a powerful force to not get rid they can't get rid of. Okay, how does this sound? The Kraken is there in the Maelstrom battle, tearing it up, and Will stabs Davy Jones' heart, and then the Kraken turns and absolutely wrecks the Armada. Oh, that would have been, yeah. yeah. That's the that ending I been, want now. Yeah. I want that ending now. That would have been better. It would have made more sense, too. Like, with with the Armada just giving up. Oh, our captain's dead. Nobody. I would him. say it's too big a budget, but you know, 
cut out some of the other big budget things and let's let's do it get rid of the johnny depp 20 minute scene i don't think it was 20 minutes but yeah it felt get like rid of davy minutes. jones locker and replace it with the kraken tearing apart the british armada and you have a and then you have a cut down day. on some of those damn deals yep it takes so long in those scenes too it's like you have something i want and then another 10 minutes goes by and it's like well you have something i want and the 20 minutes later, they're like, perhaps we could make a deal. And it's like, yo, yeah, like <laughs> you, you guys got a whole nother, like, you couldn't have cut down on this. Like, I know you're actors, you, you're acting, you're taking your time, singing lines and all that. That's great. But you can't cut it to where it takes less time between them speaking about this damn deal that they need to get to because there's so many freaking deals in this movie. Like, mm-hmm. yep. Too many deals. I feel like there's a lesson in there, but I don't know how to articulate it outside of cut it down, make make less than 10 deals. I think they focus too much on... What was, what was the dude? He was Chinese, I believe. Cao Fang. Yeah, they focus too much on that, too. Yeah, I think. yeah he, didn't, he didn't feel like... I, I think introducing a new character is a good idea. But mm-hmm. they didn't use him the way that they should have in terms of, like, plot function, which is all he's really there him. for. And then killed him. Yeah. I felt nothing when anybody died in this movie. Mm-hmm. I was that's weirded out with... Yeah, that's definitely a problem. And I was weirded out with Beckett's glorious death. And then everybody else, like, once Will got stabbed, I felt absolutely nothing still. I was like, oh, look at that. I think I did as a kid, but... Well, as a kid, yeah, I can understand that. That's like seeing mm-hmm. Spider-Man getting his ass kicked in the first one. Yeah. Yeah, I felt nothing with anybody's death. Once Davy Jones died, I was like... <laughs> well, that's saw him fall over. I was like, oh, there he goes. Yeah. Bye, dude. Yeah, I, so, okay. To build on th- on that a little bit, one other lesson. Give your characters hard choices. Or give them choices at all. Because that is the major thing that I, I said it before already. That is the thing that is really missing from this movie is robbing the characters of choice, needlessly. Mm. Final lesson: hire Hans Zimmer. It's never a bad move. I, you know what's funny? As soon as I thought, you know what? Unless one of the lessons should be hire Hans Zimmer for these movies. <laughs> I read that in your notes, and I was like, that's. Yep, we agree there. Yep. Hans is perfect. Maybe not perfect, but about as close as you can get. Final question, and I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. The second movie ever. Second one's your favorite? Yeah. So I think our our order is the same, 2-1-3. Yeah. 2-1-3. That probably wasn't my order that I would have given beforehand. I think the second one's always been my favorite, but I probably would have said two, three, one. Mm. Clearly, that's not true. Any final notes? Nope. I am physically exhausted. Same here. Just a few wrap-up things. Our next episode is going to be Last Airbender Season 2. Have you started? I have. Uh, I'm a few in. It's still good. Water Um, time. Yeah. After that, we're going to be doing Spotlight. That's my next pick. It's slowing things down a little bit and just doing one movie. I don't know what Spotlight is. It's the um, movie about the Boston Globe investigating Catholic priests back in like 2002. Ooh, it won Best boy. Picture 2015. I think it's one of the rare cases where that title was deserved. So it's good. Definitely check it out. And then after that, we'll be doing Last Airbender Season 3. You can subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. You can like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at INTAnalysis18. You can follow me on Twitter at Davos Watson. And where can people find you? Follow me on Twitter at Jelani T. Kelly. Follow me on Instagram at BasedPhoenix. And I'm on Twitch uh, at JBasedPhoenix. Boys Season 2, September 4th. It oh, has yeah. Been announced. I've... Yeah, I I saw one Bro. of the first looks. Which one? There was one with Black Noir and there was one with Stormfront. Stormfront. That's the only one I've seen. No, you got to see the one with Black Noir, Evan. That was the second okay. one that was released, Evan. Bro. 
Evan. I'll I'll definitely check it out because I know you, we're man. I know you're gonna want to do that. Um, I'm telling you, I, yeah. So damn hype. It's a little far off, but I'm hype. It's not that far off. September. Wait, what's today? Considering it's considering July, the way things August. are getting released oh, right yeah. now, that's that's soon. Mm-hmm. That is a two months. Yep. We're gonna have to do Tenant before that, but hopefully, if it when is, is allowed to be released, uh, they're saying August twelfth right now, but. We that's been the pushed theater, back though. a couple times. Uh, I is think it, he came it? with a mask on. I don't know. Either way, we're doing Tenant once it comes out because I am too pumped for that. Oh, also, weird bit of trivia. We're recording this on Jeffrey Rush's birthday, so shout out there. He's Bar- he's Barbosa. I feel like it... Oh, yeah. I was like, I feel like I should. Know I saw that is. today. I figured it's worth mentioning. Anyway, that was a weird thing to end it with. But um, if that's all, we'll see you guys. Uh, in the next episode with Last Airbender. Hard meaties. Why is the ROM always gone?